Okay, good morning everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here to discuss some ultimate questions with you this, uh, this morning. Um, when I say ultimate questions, I think I'm going to focus the majority of my time on one question. And um, maybe, maybe before I get to the question itself, let's just talk about the concept of questions. So within Judaism, um, the value system that we espouse within the educational framework is very much quite antagonistic. So, if you so you're studying for your exams, you I don't know if you'd go into a local library. And the idea of of study is something that should be silent. It should be quiet. You, you 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 do the work yourself and you focus on it. Anyone who's spent any time within you know Jewish study centres, you realise that there's an enormous amount of noise. If you go, you can Google it. What's called a yeshiva, which is a sort of rabbinic seminary, and it is so boisterous it is so loud and argumentative and the goal is to fight so that when me and my study partner all we do is argue all day long because if we are struggling with things that really matter the idea that you should just accept this is not a value that we hold by so and i don't want to i'm not a catholic scholar so i'm not going to do it in any way comparative but let me tell you from a jewish point of view do it because it's what we believe is not a Jewish value. That this is what you do, don't ask questions, don't, you know, don't just, this is, we don't know, just go with it, God has his ways. This is not a way that we look at things. Everything has to be challenged, everything has to be questioned. But it's the framework with which we ask those questions that makes the difference between whether this is going to be a constructive discussion or it's going to be something that's far more antagonistic without a productive outcome. So for example, my, so you guys know a little, I make no assumptions here. So the Second World War, if you guys learned a bit about the Holocaust, you know a bit about the Holocaust. Okay, so, so my wife's grandmother is a survivor of Auschwitz. So she, she lost her entire family, but she survived. And once she was giving a lecture to a group of high school students in Israel, where she was talking about how when she was, you know, you know every day she was being taken out to work, and they saw the chimneys that were spewing out the smoke of her relatives and family, and every day she got so angry with God. She yelled at God and she fought with God. And she, 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 she was. And the students, who were very religious students, got like, how could you argue with God? How can you challenge God? And she said, I didn't question if there was a God. I just was angry that God could do such a thing. And that, I suppose, is the dis distinction that we have to make. Between looking at the way God runs the world and saying, I have a problem with it, is very different to the question of because I have a problem with the way the world's been run, therefore the logical conclusion is that there's nobody running the world. And I think that we often put those two together. And that's the focus we're going to have for the rest of the session, is the, the ultimate question of why do bad things happen to good people? And for many people, that's, you know, that's where it starts and ends. We look at the world and we say there's, there's terrible suffering in the world, therefore there is no God. And, you know, people who are terribly evil succeed and prosper even, and therefore there is no God. Whereas the question itself is one that is very underdeveloped, and the answers themselves are ones that, albeit that, um, you know, there may or may not be an answer, nevertheless, we never entertain the answer because we are so absorbed with the question. All right, so that's, that's our trajectory for this morning. Yeah? Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, there are a couple, I'll be honest, the majority of the session is actually not going to be answering the question. <coughs> Only maybe the last 10, 15, 20 minutes. The majority is going to be dealing with the question itself. Because understand that any question that is coming from an intellectual perspective is going to need, require an intellectual answer. Every question that is coming from an emotional perspective cannot receive an intellectual answer. So let me explain this once. Okay, so I remember as a, a young student, you know, dealing with some of the world's greatest tragedies from a theological point of view, philosophically saying, well, why would God allow people to suffer? Why would God? And I came up with this, you know, nice packaged little, you know, solution. Oh, well, God, you know, because who knows, in the, you know, it just looks bad now, but ultimately it's really good. Or maybe the person grows as a result of this, or et cetera, et cetera. And I had it like, neatly put aside of how you explain evil in the world. And then my girlfriend broke up with me. And every one of those... Sorry. 
No, it's okay. Now, now, would it be fair to say that when we're looking at evils in the world, so we look at things like the Holocaust, and we look at something like that and say, why could something like that happen in the world? Compared to why did my girlfriend break up with me, would it be fair to say that my personal emotional distress at being dumped was not quite on scale with the Holocaust? Okay, I think we're all in agreement on that particular thing. But I could find no consolation in, well, Gad, you'll be better as a result. And, you know, Gad, uh, it's all for the best. If it's meant to be, it will be. And Gad, you know, character development, blah, blah, blah. None of it, res it didn't resonate. Because the difference is, when I was dealing with tragedies in the world, I was looking at them very intellectually, and I was looking at them, please can you give me an example, or can you explain to me, why does this bad thing happen? And I could work it out logically. But when it came to emotion, there is no rationale that can somehow satisfy the emotion. If you're hurting, if you're in pain, you can't rationalize it away. It just doesn't work that way. So even if you're training for a particular you know, sport event and you, you, you want to go to the Olympics, so you're training hard, it doesn't diminish the pain. You still feel terribly you know, in pain when you're running. That, you say gold medal, gold medal, so it might motivate you to get to the end, but it still hurts. So, we first, so the first you know, let's say, uh, prologue to the question is we have to say that if we are going to ask the question from an emotional point of view, there is no answer to the question. And so if someone is coming to me, so, you know, in a rabbinic capacity, this is the kind of question that you can imagine I get regularly, sitting at the deathbed of somebody in my community, and so, Rabbi Wani, why do I have to go through all these things? So the answer isn't, well, you know, there's a big picture, and God knows, and everything's ultimately good. No. The answer is you hold their hand, and you, and you go through the journey with them. Because they're not asking a question. So if someone is asking why do bad things happen to good people, you have to first and foremost understand is why they're asking this question. Are they asking it because they're hurting or they're asking because they're interested? Because the first one has not answered, the second one possibly does. Okay? We clear with that? Alright, now the second one. So I, I'm going to do So let's... Has anyone ever had this question before? If you've had this question before, put up your hand. And if you don't put up your hand, you are probably lying. Yeah? We all had this question before. Now, let, let's start off, because every question has underlying assumptions. Assumptions meaning that if you come in to ask this question, so if I come to you and I say, well, you know, why are you wearing a you know, sport uniform? So the assumption is that the white and blue is the sport uniform. It may be the correct question, but I've made an assumption that that's sport uniform. And, and your answer might be, this isn't sport uniform, I just, I'm a visitor from another school and this is a uniform at the other school. Yeah? So, you've got to question the assumptions. So, let's, what are the assumptions in this particular question? I'm, I've been pre-warned that you're unlikely to be forthcoming with answers. And I, I said, I will draw them out of you if I have to. So, what are the, there are a number of assumptions in this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Tell me an assumption. Yes. Come on. Yes, please. No, you, you're trying to give me an answer. I don't want an answer. I'm saying before we get to the answers, we've got to question the assumptions. Yeah. Narrow it, not that all people are good. Yeah? No, you give me an answer. You guys are too religious for me. I don't know what I'm going to question. Yeah. Thank you. Question number one is that the person to whom this is happening is good. So, if, if, a very, if Adolf Hitler had a car accident, no one would ask this question, right? Why did a bad thing happen to Adolf Hitler? Because he's a bad person. Right? Bad things happen to me. Okay. What's the other assumption? Yeah? What's the definition of bad? Ah! What happened is clearly 
Yeah. So when you come, so if someone comes to ask a question, and says, "Ooh, why do bad happen to good people?" So the assumption is, what is happening is obviously bad, and the person to whom it's happening is obviously good. Now, both of those assumptions we are going to question, and we're going to have to define them because who you define as good, maybe they're not good, and who you define and what you define as bad might not necessarily be bad. But I have an even better question than that. If you're asking this question, there's an even greater assumption than that what, that's happening is bad and what's hap the person to whom it's happening is good. It's a much even more subtle but incredibly profound assumption that you have. So this, what is the underlying assumption of the whole question? This is a bit tougher. You don't want to take a bash? Almost there, almost there. Bad things That's a bit, I, I, I'm going to work with yours a little bit more. Yeah, you want to talk? Excellent. Bad things, and bad things shouldn't happen to good people. That is the assumption. We start with this assumption that bad things happen shouldn't happen to good people. That's the assumption of the question. And so therefore, the, uh, what, what should be happening? So the, the mindset of the person asking the question is, bad things should not happen to good people. So who should bad things happen to? And what should happen to good people? Excellent. So I come into and I ask the rabbi, I ask the priest, I ask the imam, I ask the teacher, or whoever the case may be. I come and say, why do bad things happen to good people? He says, ah, oh, let me get this right. So your assumption is that bad things shouldn't happen to good people, right? And you will say, obviously bad things shouldn't happen to good people. So I say, hmm. So good things should happen to good people, right? Yes. And bad things should happen to bad people. Would you like to live in a world where good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Now, before you answer the question, just think about it for a moment. I don't know how you define good or how you define bad, and I'm happy at this point in time, you define it however you want to define it. Define good, so let's start like this. Bad things happen to bad people. So is stealing, will we agree? Do you have a question on the one? Exactly, you are hitting on the point that I'm going to get to in a few moments, so just hold on to it, but you're on the right track. So, let's define for a second, bad, bad, so bad people, so thieves. Is a thief a bad person? Yes, great. Okay, stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong, people who steal are doing something bad. We're all in agreement on it. Alright, so bad things should happen to thieves. Now, you, anyone here, I don't know, have music on their phone that they didn't pay for all right now if we live in a world where bad things happen to bad people it might look clear outside but i warn you lightning is coming your way because as soon if you do something bad bad will happen to you so what does that what does the world look like when all the bad things are happening that only bad people. So as soon as you see someone having a car accident, what do you say? Well, it's obviously why that happened. They obviously cheat on their taxes, cheat on their wives, you know, beat their children. I don't know what they do, but the only people who else would have an accident. Only bad people, only bad things happen to bad people, right? So something bad happening is obviously. And who's living in the mansions? All the good people. So what would that make your life look like? So I come to you and I say, what's your name? Christian. So I come to Christian and I say, Christian, I've got some music here. You want to borrow it? You want to download it? I'll, I'll airlift it over to you. Yeah? I'll give you some uh, free music. So you'd say, are you out of your mind, Gad? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Take it. Because what's going to happen as it transfers to you, boom, lightning comes. Because bad things happen to bad people, right? That's what we want. We want to live in a moral world. We want to live in a world where good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Why do we? Because we're asking this question. We say, God, you got the world wrong. You messed up the world. You created a world where good people can have bad things happen to them. We don't like that. We want to live in a world where good things only happen to good people and bad things happen to people. So tell me, sir, what does that do to your free choice? So, oh, should I cheat on the exam? Should I not? What happens if you cheat on the exam? Crash lightning. 
All right, so you're going to cheat on the exam. What would you do then? Every time you're thinking of doing something wrong, you're thinking of lying, but you realize there's an X hanging over your head, that as soon as you tell the lie, boom, you're going to get whacked. Would you like to live in such a world? Don't. So hold on a second. You, you've come with this great question, with the starting assumption that the world is messed up. God got it wrong. We've got a better alternative. So I'm just asking, would you like to live in that world? So you don't want to live in a world where good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. You don't? You want to live in that? Does anyone want to live in that world? No one wants to live in that world. So what's the problem? So what you want to live in is a world where good and bad things happen to good and bad people. Because it is only in such a world that we can have any level of free choice. And the things that make our lives matter, the thing that can distinguish between good and bad, that can allow us to live lives of fulfillment, is the fact that good and bad happen to both good and bad people. So, my, my sense is that it's, not, it's, it's a non-question. Because we start off with the assumption that God, if I was God, I would be able to run the world much better than you do. Isn't that what we're saying? Now, God, we see people starving in, uh, in Africa. Well, if I was God, that wouldn't happen. And I see people who are criminals, you know, that are, that are rising in prestige in the community. And I say, if I was God, that wouldn't happen. And I see people who are good and kind and innocent and they're suffering terribly and say, if I was God, that wouldn't happen. So what we're saying is, God, if we ran the world, we'd do a much better job than you currently do. The reality is, is, if you just think about it, we wouldn't change a thing. We need the, the, the obscurity. We need the ambiguity. We need the fact that the world is complex. So that is point number, I don't know, I've lost count of what points we are to. So the first one was the assumption that everything that happens good is bad. Well, the first one was, don't ask, give an intellectual answer to an emotional question. Second point is that we have to make the question these assumptions very good, but more importantly is if you're dealing with the question at all, you have to realize that the alternative is far worse than the question. No one wants the alternative. Yeah? Any questions yet? Questions, comments, reactions? We good? Good. See, they're all participating. You, you, you doubted them. You my, doubted them. I, I don't know about them, but my brain's full at this point. Oh, okay. Well, we, should, we, can, we can end the lesson there. <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's, so let's go now to here. Okay, so let's, we, we started with these two assumptions. What is happening is bad, and to the person to whom it's happening is good. Should we start with bad or good? Good. Bad. Bad. All right. Well, let's start with good. Let's start with good. Okay, so someone who's happening is good. How do you define good? Yeah. Um, something that will make you happy. Correct. That, that might be good for you. So it was a good burger because it tastes great. But I don't think that's the kind of good we're talking about. You're talking about a certain ethic. A good person has to conform to a particular value system. We think they're good because they buy into the value system. So like... Um, a, a, a good terrorist is able to kill lots of people, but it doesn't make them good, right? A good gun shoots accurately, but that does not make it ethically good. A good person is very difficult to define, because whereas we think we're good over here, you know, on the other side of the world, there are a lot of people who think we're terrible. So in, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, you've got the Australian forces out, fighting against ISIS. Now, imagine I had Mr. ISIS over here, and I have uh, the Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull over here, and I go to say, okay, gentlemen, on your buzzers, please. Which of you believe you are good? <coughs> Who do you think is going to hit the buzzer first? Mr. ISIS or Mr. Turnbull? Probably. But who's more convinced that they are good? So I tell you, why ISIS is more convinced because all authoritarian societies are convinced that they are right. Most democracies have a best guess of what they think is right, but they acknowledge that they might be wrong. 
And that's how democracies work. So who's... So he's convinced he's right. Who's, who's, sorry, gents, I can't remember who's who. But uh, Mr. Isis, he knows he's right. He knows he's good. He knows God is happy with him. And, you know, Malcolm Turnbull says, I, I think this is the right path. I think. I don't know. I think. So Australian forces go in and they manage to, to kill the best, you know, the top, uh, the top uh, commander in the ISIS forces. Alright? Australia, of course, what is this guy saying? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, this guy, you know, he, he prayed five times a day, he fought for the Islamic Caliphate, he, all he wanted was was that he should bring Allah and the, and the uh, you know, the, the message of, uh, you know, the Quran into the world. That's all he did his whole life and he fought for it and he gave his life. He's a martyr. He's fantastic. He was such a good man. Why do bad things happen, O oh God, O oh Allah? So this is, so we would say, well, it's obvious, right? He's not good. And, and, and the same goes into reverse. That when we see, you know, September, I, I tell you a fascinating story. This is, this is quite confronting, so I hope you, you have the maturity to hear it. So I grew up in a, a time where, um, in the 80s, where movies were always good versus bad. It's always the same. And the good guys were the, always the Americans, and the bad guys were always the Russians or the East Germans, the communists, always the bad. Every single movie. So, I don't know if you've seen many 80s movies, but like, yeah, there are Rocky. You guys see Rocky? So, with, with Drago, you know? So, oh, good versus bad, East versus West. It was always like that. So, that's how I grew up. We, the Americans, I grew up, as you sure heard from my accent, I grew up in South Africa, but we were with the Americans, yeah? The Americans are the good guys, the Russians are the bad guys. And it was obvious. When I was in my early 20s, I served in the Israeli army. Now, Israel is an interesting country because it gathers people from all over the world. And so, in, in a particular unit in the army, you can have people from every single country. So, imagine if you go to the Australian army, probably pretty much everyone in the army is going to be Australian. In the Israeli army, you have people from literally every country in the world. So, I had, I had Bolivians in my army, I had a guy from Paraguay, I had a guy from Panama, and I had a Russian. And we started talking. We were similar ages, and we were talking. And I said... What did you think on September 11, when the two planes went into the Twin Towers? What was your response? And he said, Americans got what they deserved. Now for us, <coughs> why do bad things happen to good people? But for someone who grew up in communist Russia, he questioned this underlying assumption. You assume that the Americans are the good guys. They're not the good guys. We're the good guys. So if we're looking to heaven, and we're looking at it from a theological point of view, that God, you know, why do you make bad things happen to good people? So the question is, how does God define good? Not how do we define good? If, if, so if you come from a particular faith set, so, so I'm Jewish, let's just say, and just say Jewish law demands that we keep certain, um, certain strictures, certain uh, beliefs and certain practices. So I can't eat certain foods. Let's just say, um, so I can't eat pork, right? Jews don't eat pork. So let's just say there's a Jew who eats pork. And then he has a car accident. He, he volunteers on the weekend in, uh, for the Salvation Army. He... Uh, Donates blood every second week when he can do so. He gives charity at every opportunity. He's the volunteer of the year. But he eats pork. So is he a good person or is he not a good person? Well, how do we define good? Understand that, that this person, I care about them. I love them. They seem to be innocent. They seem to be... It seems that eating pork is nowhere near as important as volunteering and being kind and, and the like. But by whose definition? So we're going to be very clear on how do we define bad, uh, good? And does the person or persons that we, we are clumping together, are we, do we have the right 
to make the assumption that the people to whom the, the, this is happening is are, are good people. Okay, that's assumption there. The other one is on the other side of bad. So bad is, you know, there's bad and there's bad. And there's certain evil atrocities that happen that it's very hard to define them any other way than, than bad. But often when we ask the question, we're not talking about those extreme cases. We're talking about some that are less pronounced, less significant. Why we have a hard time, why do I have to get a flat tire? Or why did I have to break my arm? Or why did my car get stolen? Which are different kinds of questions. And each of those, my guess is, in many cases, we've been through events that initially present themselves as being pretty bad. But as time progresses, we see, realize maybe it wasn't as bad as we initially thought. Now, obviously, the degrees. But often within life, we look at a snapshot, snapshot of reality and assume that we've seen the whole picture. So let me, can I get biblical on you for a little bit? I mean, I am a rabbi, so it's sort of like part of my, part of my job description. So, so, do you guys know the story of Joseph and his brothers? All right, so let me tell you this story. <coughs> this is, it's, a great, uh, it's a great Broadway production. So Jacob has 12 sons. The second youngest is one named Joseph. And Joseph is very beloved to Jacob. He really, he's, he's more devoted to Jacob than any of the others. And he gives him a, what is called a technicolor dream coat. He gives him a beautiful coat. And the other, you know, 11 brothers or 10 brothers are very jealous of this. And eventually it gets to the point where they say, you know, we can't handle Joseph. We don't want him anymore. And they, when they're out in the field one day, they rip his coat away, they throw him into a hole, and eventually sell him to a, a caravan of, um, of Arab merchants that are going down to Egypt. And they go back to their father Jacob, and they say, oh, we found, this, found this coat, and they covered, sprinkled blood on it, and they say, well, and Jacob said, oh, my son Joseph is dead. Okay? So that's what happens, and for 20 years, Joseph, from, from his father's point of view, is dead. Joseph goes down to Egypt, he becomes a slave, he goes into jail, then he gets appointed to the head of the jail, and he gets positioned from place to place to place. Long story short, over the 20 years that he is in Egypt, he rises up the ranks to become second in command of Egypt. He becomes what's called the viceroy. He's totally in charge of all the economic decisions that will happen in Egypt. So Joseph, you know, the, the pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has a dream and he says, oh, there's going to be a terrible famine. So Joseph creates this financial plan for Egypt that, for, you know, that they'll be able to store up food for a certain amount of time. And eventually, when the famine comes, they'll have provisions. Okay? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to t do half a, half a biblical story in, on one leg, so I hope I haven't lost you. Long story short, the famine comes. And the, Jacob looks to his 11 sons at home and says, listen, we, we are destitute. We need someone to go down to Egypt and get provisions. So they go down to Egypt. And who's in Egypt in charge of provisions? Joseph. And eventually what happens, Joseph says, ah, it all makes sense now. You know, what happened is I was stole for the last 20 years. I've been asking myself, you know what question I've been asking myself? Why do bad things happen to good people? For the last 20 years, I was rotting in a dungeon. I was accused of doing a whole bunch of things that I haven't done. I was completely rejected by my entire family and thought I'd never see them again. For 20 years, I wondered, why me, God? And you know, 20 years later, I'm now in charge of the provisions of Egypt. And who needs provisions? My family. So Joseph gets up when he reveals himself to his brothers and he says to them, do not be too disturbed, do not be distressed at the fact that I'm here, that you sold me to Egypt 30, 20 years ago, because really this was, this was a mission from God. And God sent me ahead so that when the famine came, I would be here to provide for you. Okay? Great story. That's, that's the story as we know, right? Now, is he right? For 20 years, he was wallowing in a dungeon, struggling, you know, loneliness, isolation, neglect. And now it appears 
that he can see what the divine plan was. Is he wrong? Now, uh, let's just say this is time zero. This is end of the world. Let's call it infinity. End of the world. Okay? Whenever that is. We live uh, between those two points. God's perspective is this. Now, in every story, there's some mini stories. And there's some like micro plots. Over here, some hundred odd years before Joseph was born, Joseph had a great grandfather named Abraham. And God comes to Abraham and says, I just want to tell you something. Your descendants are going to go down and be strangers in a foreign land. And they're going to be oppressed in that foreign land. And they'll be there for 400 years as slaves. And eventually I will redeem them from that foreign land and bring them to the land of Israel. That happens over here. We'll just call it A for Abraham. The story, I think, we may be familiar. People have heard of Exodus, Prince of Egypt. You know, the story of the Israelites as they left Egypt. That happens over here. Let's call it the Exodus. You know the problem? How does God get a nation that are currently living in Israel, how do you get them to be slaves in a foreign land? How do I get them out of Israel? And how do I get them to go live in a foreign land in a place that they can eventually become slaves? You know how I'll do it. I'll get a little bit of jealousy between the brothers to get the one brother sold. I'll allow that brother to rise in prominence in Egypt. So much so that when the famine hits the family, they don't just get provisions. They all move down to Egypt. Whole family moved down to Egypt because Joseph says, I'm in charge. Everything's great. I'll be here. I'll take care of you. And so the whole family goes down to Egypt. And what happens? Joseph dies. His brothers die. Pharaoh comes up and says, all these Israelites, who needs them? Let's put them to work. And that becomes the slavery. Joseph was in the middle of the story. Not at the end of the story. When we are looking at things, bad things, we are looking at life, bad things happen to good people, we are looking at life between these two factors. That what is happening is bad and the person's happening is good, but between the time, we're in the middle of the plot. If you watch a Star Wars movie and you stop it in the middle, you'll be convinced that the bad guys are going to win. Because it's the middle of the story. And that's how life is, is that we are so much in the middle of the story that we aren't at the end. We can only ask this question at the end of the story. Now once we've seen the entire, you know, uh, production from beginning to end, then we can say, ah, still it seems unfair. But until such time as we've, that has happened, we have to start with the assumption that we are still watching the story play out. It's not finished yet. So let, let's, let's, let's bring this uh, a bit closer to home. Um, I don't see any clocks, so I'm a bit concerned. It is quarter past 12, and we go till? Um, 22. Until about 30 minutes. Then. Okay. So let's take some, you know, personal stories. So, so Jewish history as a whole is, is, is quite a... Let's do it after. Jewish history over the last 2,000 years has been quite, um, quite depressing, to tell you the truth. So my... I mean, beyond the Holocaust, do you guys know much about Jewish history? Just like a nod or a shake of the head. All right, there we go. So let's, let's go back to our timeline, shall we? Okay, so this is the year 70 AD. You know, you know what happened in the year 70? It was the destruction of the temple. Okay, so all the Israelites, the Jews lived in, in Israel, Temple was destroyed in the year 70. Okay? So let's just say, this is a graph of emotional well-being, or physical well-being of a nation over time. Okay? So when things are going pretty bad, down here, when things are going pretty good, over here. So the destruction of the temple, pretty much a low point, right? So let's say it's over here. Pretty much over. So we go here, let's go to the year 1000, and now we're here 2000. 
Jewish history looks like this. What's it for me? That's Jewish history in a nutshell. Okay? This is 1948, it's the establishment of the State of Israel. This dip here is the Holocaust. But Jewish history was incredibly unpleasant for 2,000 years. Incredibly unpleasant. There is not a country in Europe that the Jews have not been expelled from. Every single country, there was a time over the last 2,000 years that Jew, it was illegal for Jews to live in that country. Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, England, Ireland. You name it, there is every single country in Europe. This is where it is. Now, if I was to come here in the year, I don't know, 90, let's call it 2018. In the year 2018, and you look at Jewish history, look, you know, Jews, we, we, we're prospering in Australia. Jewish community is very strong and vibrant over here. State of Israel is a very strong, secure country, even though there's a lot of you know, stuff happening. You look at it in a certain way and you say, well, everything seems okay. So, but there's a long story and we're still in the middle of the story. And so we're at this point where the question, it's not so much the question is a bad question, but it's, it's, it's incomplete. Okay. So let's, let's summarize this point. As I did mention at the outset that the chance we're only going to spend the last bit actually answering the question. But what we've talked about up until now, going from the beginning, number one is you can't have an emotional, you can't have an intellectual answer to an emotional question. Number two, the starting assumption of the question is the fact that the alternative would be better. Something that I think is that unanimously we all agreed would not be better if bad things only happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. We start, the third assumption we went to is the fact that the person that to whom this thing is happening is good. Something that's very difficult to define. How do we know what's good? Maybe, you know, because we think they're good, maybe they, maybe they think that, you know, they're the good guys and we're the bad guys. And therefore, the reason the bad things happen is because, you know, they weren't good. And finally, the things that are bad, which is based on the assumption that I'm seeing the full picture. And if I haven't seen the full picture, then maybe um, I can't yet ask the question. Not that it's not a good question. It's just that it's too premature to ask the question. Okay. And let's, let's now go into the next part. Which is starting with one more set of assumptions. Okay. One more set of assumptions. And this is now definition. If I'm going to ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm assuming the question is based on God, why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah? I mean, I suppose if... Because if we are not asking God, then what's the answer? Bad things happen. Yeah? No God, bad things happen. Yes, we have to say that I'm assuming that there is a reason that maybe I don't understand, or at least there's a plan. But if you're using God as the basis for the question, you have to define what you mean by God. And there are three, three separate definitions that you have to buy into if you want to ask this question. Now, you might not have thought about them before, but if you haven't thought about them before, you cannot ask this question. Number one, God knows everything. Number two, God is all-powerful. And number three, God is good. If you do not have those three definitions of God, you cannot ask the question. So let me explain. Number one, God knows everything. Why is that an important uh, assumption to make when asking the question? See, if God doesn't know everything, then why do bad things happen? Huh? No, no. Okay. If I take, so we said, so we said, one, knows everything, two, all powerful, mean can do everything, can do anything, and three, is good. God is, dot, dot, dot. All right. God knows everything. So if God, if, if I did not assume this, that God knows everything, so why do bad things happen? God didn't know about it. So we've got to go, so God, why do you, you know, why was there a genocide in Myanmar? There's a genocide in Myanmar? 
Uh, where was I? I didn't know. Sorry, I was so busy dealing with the, you know, riots in the South America. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. So, number two, God is all powerful. Can do anything. If I don't make that assumption, why do bad things happen? But I would love to do something, but what can I do? My arms are tight. My hands are tight. God says, "Listen, I, I see, I see terrible people are suffering over there, and I feel terrible about it, but I, I just can't do anything about it." And number three. God is good. If God isn't good, why do bad things happen? <laughs> God's bad. You know, God isn't good. So you need to have all three of these assumptions. If you don't have these assumptions, you can't ask the question. So I, I don't know how often we question these assumptions. Now, I think it's, it, it is important that each person... Now, I'm a, a rabbi, but I didn't grow up... I didn't grow up what I suppose we would call religious. I grew up in a, a family that was loosely affiliated, so let's say the Christian equivalent of, you know, going to church on Christmas and Easter and that's it. So then I was that kind of Jew. <coughs> and one of the things that I found is that my knowledge of God was incredibly immature. So my guess is when you guys were in preschool, you, you'd have a religious experience that went something wrong oh, we should say grace you know we should thank god for food oh who's god oh, god's everywhere god loves us god is good he's invisible but he's infinite and so on and so forth yeah that's resonant that's that's god and this is at the time we you believed in the tooth fairy and santa okay yeah okay then you go into year K, okay, one, two, three, and probably around year four, year five, you start realizing that there's no such thing as a tooth fairy, it's your parents, and there's no such thing as Santa. Yes? You've grown up. But how has your theological understanding of God changed? You've come to the assumption that Santa's not true, even though I was raised believing that he is. The tooth fairy is not true, even though I was raised that she is true. What about God? Is God, has it developed? I mean, my maths is on a much greater level now in year five than it was when I was in preschool. And science, my understanding of science is much greater than it was when I was in preschool. How's your understanding of God? Is, is God the same God you believed in in preschool? So if I come to you each and every morning and say, tell me, explain God to me. Say, ah, oh, God is visible, God is everywhere, and he's good, and he loves us, and uh, is it exactly the same? Because if it's exactly the same, so you are believing, you will have a spiritual, so let's say, you've got, you've got your IQ, which is your intellectual quotient, which shows uh, how like, smart you are at school. You have your emotional, your EQ, your emotional quotient, which shows how, how well you read people and how sensitive you are to them. So let's talk about a spiritual quotient, your spiritual age. So you have an, an emotional age, I'm hoping as you guys are 16, you have a spiritual age, you have a physical age of 16, you have an intellectual age of 16, and you have a spiritual age of 3. And what happens is the spiritual age of 3 comes and asks an intellect, a person with an intellect of a 16 year old, but with a spiritual understanding of a 3 year old, asks this question and says, well obviously there's no God. Yeah, you know why? Because you've got a 3 year old understanding of what God is. You've got to get out of that system. You've got to be able to look at this question with a sense of, of intelligence that you've never, de you're never dedicated to understanding the spiritual side of things, only the physical. So I give you some, let me give you some example. Your understanding of God, whether you believe in God or not, but your understanding of, let's say, the Judeo-Christian God. Does God have an arm? God have hands. Does God have eyes, ears? Nose, legs. Just do this or this. Does God have an arm, body, leg? He does have an arm. Can you see the arms? So he has invisible arms. Okay. So most people say, no, God obviously doesn't. God's not physical. God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have arms, legs. No. See, but throughout the Bible, it talks about the hand of God. You know, we stood at the feet of God. We, God saw. God spoke. So these are very physical terms. So most people say, it's metaphor. God doesn't really walk. It says God walked through the garden. It wasn't God wasn't walking. It's just a metaphor. So we can understand. 
That's, I think, how most people understand it. Yeah? Anyone? Yeah? Okay. What about emotions? Does God have emotions? Does God get happy? God be sad? God gets angry? God gets depressed? So, are those also physical traits? Because, you know, one of the things about emotion is we have the ability to influence other people. You know, if I want you to be happy, you know, if I, I reckon if I gave you each $1,000 now, you'd probably be happy. Right? I can be happy. And if I were to say, all right, at the end of class, please put, we'll put your hands on the table, I'm going to smash it with a, with a hammer, it'd probably make you all sad. I have that ability to influence you. I'm not going to do it. I just saw some worried looks. Um, but I have the ability to influence you. So what about God? Can I influence God? Can I make God happy? Can I make God angry? So you know what theology, Jewish theology this is? You can't. You're asking the wrong questions. You can't make God happy. I can't. God is infinite. I cannot affect God in that way. Ah, but the Torah, the Bible always talks about that God is angry. Yeah, it's metaphor. It's all metaphor. Understand that when God relates to us, He relates to us in a way that makes sense to us, not because that's how it ultimately is. God doesn't have hands, God doesn't have legs, God doesn't get angry, and God doesn't get happy. So, if we are starting to understand and ask questions of God, first we need to define and understand God. Good? Okay, let's go. Now, after all that introduction, let's go now to actually the question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you still have the question? Do you, but do you understand what I've been trying to go through with you this, this morning is that we don't appreciate how profound and how complex the question is. It becomes a throwaway line for people who are too lazy to do the intellectual effort to actually find an answer. They just come in, they sit at the back of church and say, Oh, father, father, so and so, yeah. What do bad things happen to good people? And I like, cross my, you know, cross my arms, cross my legs, and I go to sleep, as if we've got the question that we can, we can triumph over every rabbi, imam, priest, you name it. We've got the ultimate question, but we haven't even thought about the question. We spent the last forty-five minutes just trying to understand the question before we can even start developing an answer. So I'm going to give you a few basic outlines to Jewish theology that sort of understands of different ways of um, appropriating this answer. So number one is that, so the, there's a rabbinic text called Medrash. And Medrash is sort of a, you know, a story type method that teaches values. And when it comes to the idea of suffering, it gives three different analogies of how we can sort of put this thing in our, in our uh, we can sort of rationalize it to ourselves that can make sense of something like this. Number one, he talks, he gives an analogy of what's called flax. So there's certain things, so anyone, uh, any cricketers here? Anyone play cricket now? All right, so, <laughs> so cricket. So if you want to know something about cricket bats, new cricket bats are no good. If you get a cricket bat and you go by in the store and you go out and you, you take it from the shop and you go play with it in the centre, it's no good. It's likely to break. You've got to wear it in. The more you use it, the better it gets. Certain things you've got to be able to, you know, do it time and time again. The more you do it, the more you refine it, the more useful it becomes. And so when God wants to refine the character of the individual, he can only refine it through challenges. You know, if you guys do exercise or, you know, if you want to see a difference in your performance or in your health, you've got to do weights that are going to hurt. You've got to run that distance that feels the pain. If you go to gym and you're like lifting weights and it's just like this, you know, so you can do this until the cows come home. You're not going to notice any significant difference. It has to hurt. Only through pain is there able to be any level of growth. And even though that pain is not pleasant, although, you know, sometimes in the gym you can enjoy the burn, more often than not, it's the, the harder the burn, the more painful the experience, the greater the, the, the benefit. And so that's the first analogy that the Medrash brings. 
is that like flax, to use this example of flax, I'm using the cricket bat, is that as the individual endures, so they become more refined, it enhances their character. And, and we see this in our world, that people that endure terrible suffering at times become more compassionate, more understanding, greater contributors. There's a, um, one of the great ironies of the 20th century, it might, it's pre predates you guys, I think, but you guys ever heard of Christopher Reeves? It doesn't predate the teachers, but the, so Christopher Reeves, so, so when I was a kid, the, the original Superman movies, the star Superman was called Christopher Reeves. And Christopher Reeves, you know, about probably 20 odd years ago, had a um, horse riding accident and he became a quadriplegic. Okay? So Superman, who literally could, had absolutely no mobility from the neck down. He was one of the greatest ironies. And in an interview afterwards, he said, they asked him, like, tell us about your life post-accident. And he said that he is living a far more fulfilled life and more purposeful existence post the accident than he ever lived beforehand. So challenge can bring out the best of people. And so that is one example that is brought by the Madrash as to why suffering happens. The second one has to do with, um, uh, use the example, tapo. You guys know what Tupperware is? So the, the way the Metro does is you take a utensil and the artisan who fashions the utensil will bash it and, and so if you've got a Tupperware party, this is what they used to do back in the day. So you say this Tupperware, this is so strong, they'd have elephants stand on the Tupperware. They'd be, um, they would um, you know, do whatever, you know, take it to the, to the North Pole, st stick it in a furnace, whatever the case might be. To show that not that the fire or the or the trauma that the Tupperware endures makes it in any way better, but it impresses those around them. And so the artisan wants to show you. You see how do you see this knife? I'm sure you see this on the on the chat. You see this knife? I can cut through a brick and then I can cut a piece of meat. So why are you doing that? Because it shows you what the knife's capable of. So so too does God challenge people. Not necessarily because what it does to them. Cutting the brick does not help the knife. But it impresses those people around them. That when we watch others endure their suffering and go through their processes, it allows us to become greater people. That the, you know, the gauntlet is thrown down to us that when you see someone suffering, do you ask the question, why would you say, what can I do as a result? When I see somebody in peril, do I look at it as an opportunity to change myself, to make it better? Or do I say, why? So the second analogy that's brought out is that, you know what? Is that when bad things happen, it forces everybody around to witness it and not be bystanders. And to be able to, for them to grow from the experience and them to learn from the experience. So that's the second analogy. The third analogy that the, the Medrash brings is of a cow. That the, the stronger the cow, the more the burden you put on it, so the ox, so to speak, the more you burden you, you put on it. And, and, and similarly, the more food you will give it at the end of the day. Is that within the world, there are certain people who are stronger characters and they can carry a lot more weight. And the pain that they carry is one that they can, that, that Hashem, that God, like we call God Hashem, that God puts burdens on people because they are great. And their resilience and ability to withstand that puts them in a position that, you know, that they will be amply rewarded in the world to come, you know, in heaven or whatever you want to call it. But it's the strength in them that brings them that uh, is the reason that they've been challenged. They're not challenged because of weakness, they're challenged because of strength. And it's out of that where people often use the quote that God only tests people according to the, you know, the limits of their personal abilities and their own resilience. And so those are three approaches which by no means answer every question. These are not, uh, there's no silver bullet, there's no magic wand that I can come up and say, this is why every bad thing in history. But if you're going to ask the question, most importantly, you've got to ask it for yourself. So there's a great psychologist named Viktor Frankl, who similarly was a Holocaust survivor. 
And one of the things that he came up, he developed a form of therapy called logotherapy, which is use your suffering as a means to changing the world. Because what are your options? So something bad has happened to you. Whatever, no matter how trivial it is or how significant it is. So what are your options? Your options are going to say, this thing happened to me, I can grow as a result. Or I can say, this thing happened to me and that's it. And so what Viktor Frankl says is that using all suffering as a means to making the world better, as a means to change in the world, as a means to doing something different and to embrace change, so it means that that suffering was not in vain. It can mean something. So that's uh, sort of how we end it. So in a nutshell, Judaism, which is, is it, we never ask the question why. Because ultimately, what, does, what difference does it make? The best you can get is an answer. The ultimate question we ask is what? When you see someone suffering, what can I do? Instead of talking philosophically, you know, waxing and weighing about, oh, why do bad things happen? It's looking at those things and saying, what can I do to alleviate that suffering? How can I support that person as they endure their suffering? And how can I make a difference despite their suffering? So ultimately, that's sort of how you know, we approach this, definitely how I approach it in my own community. And yeah, we'll call it that. So we have, do we have time or are we done? We have about another 10 minutes. Or we have so. another 10 minutes. So I'm happy to take any questions, comments, reactions. Rabbi Gad, I've got a couple of students who've got to go and get ready for an assessment. No worries. Can I get that to go? So it's about the T of you need to go? Um, yeah. You can go? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> They've just got to go and get change for a dance uh, yeah. Good luck for that. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Good luck for your assessment. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. Yes. Does your perspective come from just, is this like all of the Jewish faith or does it just come from like Orthodox Christianity? So I, I would say that it is, my presentation is predominantly of the Orthodox because in the other streams of Judaism, these assumptions are not necessarily held. So, for example, there's a book called Why Do Bad Things Happen, written by a guy named Harold Kushner. And he's not a, he's a non-orthodox, he's a, he's a reconstructionist or reform rabbi. And he says, now he had terrible tragedy in his life. He had a child that was born with a particular um, uh, illness where you age very rapidly in your body. So you get to like adolescence and your body pretty much shuts down of old age. And he was coming to grips with why would bad things happen. And his assumption was that God isn't all powerful. That God sets up the world, you know, God set up nature and sort of just let it go. And now God is powerless to um, intervene. And so why do bad things happen? Because God doesn't intervene. God sits and watches. And God would love to intervene, but God doesn't intervene. So the Orthodox would never hold on that. So, so yeah. Uh, questions? Yeah. How did I, okay, so the question was that I grew up in an irreligious family, so at which point did... Um, life is very complex, and I think we, we do it a disservice by trying to simplify things by saying there was a moment, there was a flash of light, or, you know, an inspirational talk, or an inspirational person that like from that moment onwards everything shifted that may happen to some people but my experience is that very seldom is that the case we are all very much composites of all the experiences we have in life the opportunities we take and those that we don't and the decisions that we make so my journey started um, when i was about 16 17 where i first started wondering is there more to to life than i was currently experiencing and it took a long time so from that point until i actually became a rabbi was about was about 10 years 
and I would say that the journey, I, I, I'm still on the journey. I'm very open to the fact that the path I'm currently on might look very different in 10 years time from now. So it was a combination of, um, of not, of actually rejection rather than acceptance. I rejected my, the lifestyle that I've been brought up with and decided to find another one. Um, and it could have gone either way of embracing Judaism what had happened or rejecting Judaism. But this sort of wishy-washy, sort of do it but not really do it, sort of believe it but not really believe it, I, I rejected that. And that's sort of how I found my way. That's the short answer. Right. Yeah. No? Good? No? Alright. So I'm, I'm, I can stand here and do a jig if you want. But, uh, no. Uh, it's different from Gabrielle's question. What role do you see God plays in your life? So, do you see his guidance? Or? Um, God for me is, um, is a permanent consciousness that I live with. That it's not a, a it's not a consciousness in a sense that every second, but the idea that when I when I stand here speaking to you, I'm very aware that I'm I'm in many ways representing I'm representing Judaism, for better or for worse. And I'm cognizant of the fact that God has put responsibility on my shoulders to do a good job of doing that. When I interact with people, you know, when people come and talk to me, I'm very aware that they are embedded with the a spark of divinity, as all humans are, and I need to be conscious of that, so to not be dismissive of people because of that godliness. So God really is, I, I try to infuse God into all aspects of my life. There's no godless aspect of my existence. So Judaism is quite a, a regimented practice. We don't, you know, our laws dictate almost every aspect of daily life on what we can, can't, and should and shouldn't do. And so there's this conscious awareness. So before I eat, there's a certain blessing I need to make before I eat. Different blessing for different kinds of food. And um, when I engage with people, there's certain conversations that I can have, there's certain conversations I can't have. So if you were to come to me and start bad mouthing someone, I have to stand off, you know, in, you know, no matter what, because there's a prohibition called Loshan Hora, negative speech. So because it's so legislated, I'm, I'm always aware that God is in my life. And, um, and I try to make that, uh, it's not a burden. I don't walk around with you know, the cloud of doom and gloom over my head that says, oh, if I do bad, God's gonna be angry. It's not that at all. But it's very much that this, this divine partnership that man is, is uh, encouraged to embrace and is part of our existence um, all the time. Well, I, I don't think any of them. I mean, probably the, the, the main thing, bad thing, reason bad things happen to good, to good people, according to your, your, the, the start of your question, is because there's some really bad people out there that do bad things. But I never said that at all. I mean, uh, my assumption was that this, this, the, the methodology that we followed would be true for natural or unnatural. See, human-caused evil is very easy to explain. So the question is, why doesn't God stop them? Why doesn't God stop bad people doing bad things? So the answer is because God gives us free choice and um, we misuse it at times. But I think it, it, it is equally true that why do floods, earthquakes and, and the like happen? So again, is that we start with the assumption that what's happening is terribly bad. I, I would still take a step further in saying that even when natural disasters happen, the onus is on man to question, like, why does it have, you know, there's a, there was a, when were the bad floods in Brisbane? Were like two, three years ago when they had the bad floods in Brisbane? Two, uh, yeah, two, uh, Okay, so, so seven years ago, there were terrible floods in Brisbane. To the best of my knowledge, there were either none or very limited casualties. Yeah, there's a lot of damage, but very limited casualties. One flood takes place in India, thousands of people are killed. So what's the difference between Brisbane and India? the infrastructure and the infrastructure is a man-made problem not a god-made problem floods happen 
Floods happen everywhere. But floods don't have to bring destruction. Floods bring destruction to places that can't afford to, um, to provide adequate infrastructure to ensure that they don't destroy. It's a man -made. Most God, you know, natural consequences, they bring enormous damage, but destruction and death, especially in the 21st century, most of it man has a hand to play. Uh, not necessarily in creating it, but in creating the, or allowing the level of destruction to get as bad as it did. You see that all over the place, you know, where the disease, I mean, the amount of people that die in Africa every year from malaria, which is a very preventable disease. So, you know, why does that happen? Because we're spending billions and billions of dollars on, on, on war machines and less money on, uh, on healthcare. Can you imagine, you know, if we, if, if we stopped, you know, waging wars and put it all towards healthcare, the world would look like a very different place. So it is a man-made problem or a God-made problem? That's that mom. Okay. Ah, okay.